and don't have to read the book. <laughs> I mean, we don't know many of those book clubs. I mean, we've got wine, which most book clubs have, uh, but then you have to read the book. Yeah, you don't have to. You can, you can listen to what we're saying, you can interact with the author, and you can get the story behind the story. And that's really what it is about. So, without further ado, Ikazi, and my pronunciations are going to be absolutely shocking, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go for it. Um, the Lukasi, the South African township, once an apartheid ghetto, is today an amazingly transformed place. This township today is an el is, is electric mix of mansions, shacks, spaza shops, rocking taverns, hawkers, taxis, and hot wheels. In this Kazi, there are vibrant businesses, energetic people, a tightly networked social community, and abundant hope. That is not to say that there isn't extreme poverty, suffering, and dissatisfaction, particularly on the peripheries in the huge sack, uh, shack settlements, but to paint the, the place uh, as a slump is a massive mistake. Cosinomics attempts to cause a light on the invisible matrix at the heart of South Africans in formal uh, economies and the people who live in them. Living and doing business in African marketplaces requires an ethos uh, equally suited to the informal, to the invisible, to the intangible. Cosinomics will take you down those rural pathways, weave between the claustrophobic mazes of shacks, browse a multi-market, visit a spirit return, returning ceremony, and save money with Gogo in a stock fell among many more people and places. After almost 20 years of focusing on marketing to the informal sector, Gigi Alcock, CEO of specialist marketing company Minanawe, showcases a number of groundbreaking and very successful case studies in this invisible, informal world. His vivid antidotes and life experiences and how they link to understanding and inspiration for business ideas will make you gasp, laugh, and shake your head in wonder. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a conversation with this man. Gigi. For everybody to understand who the man Gigi is and, 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 and what you are about and um, a bit of your, your history and your context, please share with us who Gigi Alcock really is. Hi, everyone. So, um, we, my, my parents were political activists and uh, they Sorry. believed the only way to change people's lives was to live just like them. So, uh, when I was a child, they moved to a place called Msinga, it was in Natal, which uh, was the poorest place in Africa and uh, is still officially the poorest district in South Africa um, and the most violent place in Africa at the time, and um, they built a mud hut with no running water, no electricity, um, and no kitchen, etc., etc. And we grew up in this mud hut. Um, we were incredibly poor, um, and uh, my mother taught us at home under an acacia tree. Uh, we used the river as, in fact, my mother still lives like that, um, in Msinga, no running water, no electricity. Uh, and she says she's got more running water than most people in the city because she lives on the Tugela River and she walks down to the river every afternoon to wash. So we grew up in that environment and um, we were brought up as uh, goat herds um, in the Zulu um, village in essence. We felt we were incredibly underprivileged because we didn't have much. Um, in fact, uh, whenever we visited friends in town and they had meat, we used to say what died, because the only time we ate meat was when something died. Wow. Um, and we, um, yeah, I think I often say that the only benefit I had of uh, being white in apartheid South Africa was taken away from me quite young. And that was that I lost my tooth, uh, and I put it on the, my little slip slops next to the mattress on the floor that I slept. And in the morning I got five cents which kind of shows inflation. I mean, my kids are thinking 20 rand now for their teeth. And um, so um, my friend Mako Songke saw the, the, um, the, the five cents for the tooth and he thought this was quite cool. And when he went home uh, a few days later, and he, weeks later, whatever, he lost his tooth, he took it out and he put it on the uh, double zwane, which are the car tire shoes next to the tansi, the grass mat that he slept on. And um, 
he woke up excited in the morning and his tooth was still on the double zone. So he was uh, quite upset, but he left it there for a few days and eventually gave up and came to visit me with some of the other kids we grew up with. And uh, he said, um, and we were discussing this, and he said he thought that um, there's something called Idelezi, which is a very pretty orchid that grows, that's grown in the trees outside the, the kraal, and it protects, it's called Idelezi, it protects the um, home from evil spirits. And he said, well, you know, if it protects the home and, and creates this protection around the home, maybe the tooth fairy can't fly into the home. So my friend Skegeli said, no, 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 he said, it's the Mviti branch. You get a branch of a tree called the Mviti that you put in the eaves of the roof and it protects the home from lightning. And Skegeli said, well, if that protects the house from lightning and the fairy comes through the air, then it's, that's the Mviti branch is protecting. Um, yeah. And maybe we must take the Mviti branch off and we'll get the five cents. So my father overheard this uh, discussion and uh, he called us all and he told us what... Uh, the whole story of the tooth fairy. And I thought this was really cool because I knew that my father would give every kid in the valley five cents for their teeth. Instead he banned the practice and it was the <laughs> last time I benefited from, from that. Yeah. So that is how I grew up. Wow. Gigi. <laughs> I've got two questions and they're both related to your name. So, so... Gigi, what does what what Gigi stand for and, and what was your Zulu name? I'm sure you must have, you must have had one. So in, in, um, in, in Zulu culture, you are named after um, a characteristic or you're named after an event. Um, my brother is called Umakonya, which means to make a loud noise, like to bellow like a bull. And he's very loud and, and very appropriate. Um, I was named after an event and, and my parents were fighting forced removals and um, they were, my mother had me on her hip and she was stopping bulldozers from bulldozing down people's homes in a famous area called Lion Hill which had extensive removals and I was named after that event and um, the event was um, Iskatiska Gigi and Gigi was the number plate of the government um, trucks and bulldozers that were bulldozing down oh, people's homes. So, in fact, there's a Johnny Clegg song, When's I'm a Gigi, I got Nagi no Naga, which means, what's Gigi doing? He doesn't care. Which people used to sing to me when I was young, they'd say, do you care? You know, yeah. so, but I'm the pers first personalized number plate in South Africa. So, <laughs> I, w I, was christened, I was christened Mark John, um, and I've never been called that by anyone except the bank manager when I was in trouble. So um, I, I, ch I had to change my name to Gigi. So it's a, it's a registration number. I wish it was more romantic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, 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 they always say if you, if you ever feel unloved, you ever feel nobody cares, uh, you feel alone in this world, um, you're wondering what you're doing here, do you have a purpose, just miss a few payments. Your bank manager will phone you. He will want to know how you are. Uh, he'll call you on your first name. He'll phone you actually every day uh, for a while. So uh, just one strategy that I don't advise my clients to follow. Gigi, um, so 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 to get more behind behind the the, the man um, who wrote the book, you you know during our, our preliminary conversation. You mentioned the names of your daughters. Do you want to share with us how, how that came about and, and what their names mean? So I have very blonde and blue-eyed and beautiful daughters and their names are Tonsi, my oldest one is called Tonsi, which uh, means snowdrop. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, very few people can pronounce it. She, she was on Idols last year for a brief time and uh, she introduced herself and Proverb, the host, is Sutu and he couldn't say the ta uh, part, the tonsi, he kept on calling her konsi, so she had to correct people. So she created quite a stir and um, I was in Msinga where I grew up the, the other day and some, a, car, a taxi came driving down the road and I was cycling and screeched a stop and someone leant out the window and said, Hey Gigi, I saw Tonsi on TV. And of course, it was the only white girl who spoke to you know, and sang a bit of Zulu in their song. Um, my other daughter is called Zandi uh, and um, she, um, 
and and I, 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 I must tell the story is that Zandi doesn't have an English name. Her only name is Zandi, and um, she's very proud of the fact that uh, she's Zulu culturally. And I was at a restaurant a while ago, and um, a lady said to Zandi, "Why um, are you? You know, what's your English name?" So Zandi said, "No, I don't have one. I'm just Zandi." So the lady said, "Well, why would you be called Zandi?" She said, "Well, my father's Zulu." So the um, <laughs> the, the waitress looked at this blonde, blue-eyed girl and said, Your father's Zulu? She said, Yes. The waitress said, Where is he? So Zandi pointed across the room at me and, and the waiter looked and said, Ah, he's not Zulu. So Zandi was very upset, you know, because, um, you know, she says I'm Zulu because culturally is how she sees it versus racially. She speaks Zulu, she visits Boko and Msinga. And um, so she said to the lady, Waza, come, I'll show you that my father Zulu. So the waitress came over with Zandi and, and greeted me and we chatted in Zulu and she said, oh, you speak Zulu, eh? Yeah. Um, so anyway, but she said, um, you're not Zulu. She said, no, I am Zulu. I said, my mom, my mom, Velasi, was in Matunwene. I told her my mother's mom, Velasi, from the Tuni tribe. It's not true, but it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so she said, so she was fascinated and she's now staring at me. And um, she said, I said, what's wrong? She said, hey, I'll find in a colour. <laughs> you, you don't look like a colour. So I said, you know, colours aren't the same. I said, uh, my, uh, I said uh, you know, I'm quite white um, for a colour, but you can see my brother, he's pitch black. She said, I'll show you your poor brother. <laughs> Now, Gigi, you must have been in plenty of situations where um, you've heard the Zulu, where people didn't think that you heard what they said. What was one of the most um, funniest moments that you had where, where, where somebody said something and they didn't know that you were also Zulu? So, so uh, in fact, it was a learning experience for me was that... Uh, we all, as I said earlier, we always felt very underprivileged, and and um, and you know, when I moved to the city, um, I kind of came here as a as a migrant worker. I spent a lot of time in the migrant worker hostels in downtown Johannesburg. I felt kind of uncomfortable in in typical white company. Um, it was still the old apartheid days, and, and I used to rather go to Soweto and visit my friends or to the hostels. Um, and um, anyway, I was in a pick and pay in Northgate, and I was writing out a check, which shows how long ago it was. My kids don't know what a check is. Yeah. And um, I was writing out a check, and the lady behind the counter said to the lady packing the bags, which means, look at this white man, he's got hair like a baboon. <laughs> Referring to my arms, as you can see. But, um, so I said nothing, I wrote out the check and I tore it out and I gave it to her and I said, what why won't you pay anybody check? <laughs> have, have you ever seen a baboon writing out a check? <laughs> With which she, she screamed and she said, sorry boss. <laughs> so I said, oh, send so baboon for you, send your boss, man. And I've gone from baboon to boss. <laughs> With which she fled and she stood behind this pillar going, sorry boss, sorry boss. And, um, Everyone told each other, of course, the whole place started laughing. The madams were going, what's going on in the front there? And um, so someone had to finish my transaction. And, and I guess one of the lessons I talk about in the book is, is that I realized at that moment that what we need to understand is not just language, and we often get trapped in understanding language. There's many people who speak different languages. But to understand people on a deeper level, and that's understanding What's ironies? What's humour? Um, what what is sarcasm? Um, what are people's hopes? What are their fears? What are their dreams? And when we understand these things, particularly from a marketing space which I operate in, um, we're able to understand and and um, connect with people and communicate with people better. So it's not just about language, but very importantly, it's about understanding culture. Um, and culture is a thing that lives among us all the time. Um, people confuse tradition and culture, you know, traditions what happened in the past. Culture is very much um, with us, and, and we talk about how people modernize, they don't just westernize, and when they modernize, they carry their culture with them. And these are important things we need to understand as a country in terms of a divided society, but they're also big lessons which 
certainly we've, we've got built on in terms of our business. Thank you, Gigi. So, so you've, you've, you've titled your book uh, Kazi-nomics. Yeah. It's, your, it's your second book. Your first book was, was Third Child. Give us, give us a brief um, background on Third Child. What was, what was Third Child about and why, why did you name the book Third Child? So, it was Third World Child. Um, no, 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 sorry. Um, white born Zulu bread. Um, and um, so, Third World Child was uh, the story, I guess, a memoir in a way of growing up as a, as a Zulu child. And, um, and, I, and one of the reasons I wrote it was that I, I really believe that there's a lot of hand wringing and there's a lot of kind of caricatures in terms of apartheid stories and things like that. And, and often they don't lead to a greater understanding between people. So part of it was about growing up as a white child in a Zulu society and then arriving in a white city, I guess, as a Zulu person, because culturally I, I was I felt very much like that. It's also a bit of an adventure story. I think you grow up in that society, there's a whole bunch of... Um, wild and crazy adventures. Everyone who reads it says to me uh, how much of it was true. Um, it, uh, it is all true, but uh, it's fairly unique growing up in that environment. But um, importantly, Third World Child was about, um, or was in a sense related to, to Johnny Clegg's song Third World Child, and Johnny's a, a friend of mine, and we grew up with these, these songs of Jamuka in our heads, and they were the one kind of space where we kind of felt there was another white person who could kind of understand what we were talking about when we spoke to whites. Um, and, but it is a journey. It is a journey from a, a, a tribal society, um, uh, growing up as a Zulu child, moving to the city, um, and, and building a life in, in the city, and yet still relating back to, to your home. Um, my father was assassinated when I was 14. Um, because he was very involved in anti-apartheid activity. And some of the story is also about that and, and dealing with that. And, and um, um, after he died, we had to return his spirit, which is what the Zulus do. Um, and we had a Zulu impi who wanted to go and get um, revenge for, for it. And, and it's also about dealing with those things and understanding these transitions of manhood from a Zulu perspective, but also as kind of a white person trapped in this Zulu space. Um, so yeah, that's that's the world's child. I, I mean, fascinating. And I mean, first of all, you know, when, when 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 I think about that story, I think there must have been a bit of a transition for your parents to move into that world at a stage, and then for you, you know, having trans transition from that world. And both those transitions must have been huge. You know, I call them phoenix processes. Does everybody know what a phoenix is. You know, where, where a certain portion dies for something new to blossom, and, and that death is usually quite a, quite a transformative and a, and, a, and a heavy emotional experience. How, how was your experience of, of your feelings process from the one to the other? In, in some ways, I still haven't emerged out of the ashes or made the transition. Um, my ex-wife swears that uh, I wanted to be like a Zulu and have many wives. Um, <laughs> it's not true. Um, but um, I, I, I think it was, I mean, we grew up with all white kids, we were eventually forced by the government to go to the local government school because the government said that white children should grow up with other white children. So we moved into this uh, government school where the, parent, the, the kids of, of uh, policemen and local farmers and local government officials who my parents were in conflict with were sleeping in the bed next to us in the hostel and uh, we were seen as, as these weird people um, and uh, people were incredibly racist towards us um, with choice names given to us and, and that kind of So that was a transition moving from where we felt at home and comfortable in the Zulu community where we were young warriors, we, we had a pecking order, there's a very strong hierarchical warrior code that you grow up as a child and you move through the different levels, to suddenly arriving in a hostel where we were just in a bunch of, of white kids who sort of looked down on us. Um, and I hated school. I mean, it, it, uh, you said you know why. <laughs> um, because of that. And then, um, 
moving from that um, into an essence, well, I then became a political activist. Uh, and I say, you know, most political people in politics and some of my uh, friends that I worked with at those times are ministers or ex-ministers or stuff like that. Um, some did good things and some are in the papers as we speak. But um, I've always said that you either stay in um, politics and do business on the side or you move from politics into business. So I moved from, from politics, but as a political activist. And that was another transition which I talk about in Third World Child. Um, I was involved in land issues and, and uh, with UDF aligned organizations. Um, and then I arrived in the big city and they call um, Johannesburg Wandonga Zyatuma, which means the place where the walls thunder. And I can tell you as a young rural person, the walls thunder and they fearsome. Um, and it was learning that coming to the city and, and, uh, and uh, the fear of the walls that thunder and, and uh, a lot of it was uh, relying then on, on the elders in, in, who were in Johannesburg who one could, who'd worked here for years and they weren't, didn't have the benefit of being white so they always looked down on but they had great wisdom and, um, and that was a transition too into another society. But, um, I think one of the things I, I write about in, in the book is that my brother and I were chameleons, cultural chameleons that could move between different worlds. Um, and I still, I just came from Soweto this, uh, this afternoon, and in many ways I'm more comfortable in that kind of society. Um, and, and I'm lucky to be able to move between these two different worlds. So when it was difficult in one world, I'd shoot off to a Shabin in Soweto and <clears throat> hang out with my friends as Fordini and, and uh, do that. So um, I had that ability to go between those, those um, worlds. So, you know, when Mandela was inaugurated, I was in Soweto until three in the morning. And my girlfriend at the time was furious with me because uh, she didn't want to come to Soweto and I hadn't spent the day with her. So those are the kind of things we balance. I, I absolutely love what Gigi told me, um, you know, when we were having a conversation beforehand. His, his father said he, they were too poor, so you could never send him to university. But he, he promised them one thing, is that he could give you an education in Africa. So, yeah, he said um, he, would, he couldn't afford to send me to Varsity, but he said, I'll prepare you for a life in Africa. And I think to a large extent wow. that was what, what he was able to do. Wow. And, and, and that money can't buy. So, then you wrote your second book, Casinomics. What, what was the reason to do the second book? To be honest, my publisher at the back forced me to do it. <laughs> so, um, so I, when I, I, I eventually, in Jasper, um, uh, formed a business called Minanawe Marketing, which is a marketing business. Minanawe means you and I, and it was built on the premise of um, creating relationships um, between brands and people and, and the human part of marketing, I guess. Um, it's also a wedding song, and um, I always think it's very appropriate because uh, you sing Mina Nawe when you walk into the church on your wedding day, and it's got a dance, and you step two steps forward and one step back in this dance. Yeah. I often say marriage is the opposite way around, one step forward and two back. <laughs> That's the sign. So, um, and Mina Nawe are involved in some amazing um, groundbreaking um, activity business in the township environment at a time when people didn't believe there was business in that. You know, you had the main market, which was the white market, and then people kind of messed around in it. And we created these amazing things. I mean, some of the crazy stuff is we created the Soweto Beach Party, which was the biggest music event in this. Uh, in, in South Africa for 10 years in a row. We put 400 tons of beach sand down on a beach in Soweto. We brought these ocean-going yachts, um, about 12 ocean-going yachts in the middle of the night, and we put them in the, in the power park dam outside the power station in Soweto, where those big towers are. Um, and it was crazy, because I had to hire these yachts from 
these guys at the Vol, and I went and I spoke to them, and they've got these huge trains, they put them on a truck, and they can transport them, and they're cool, yeah, you can hire them. Where are you taking them? So I said, so where to? They're, what? Where are you taking them? No, 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 no. So I had to renegotiate. I shouldn't have told them. And in the morning, everyone arrived going to work, and suddenly there were these 12 ocean-going yachts with, um, it was for Captain Morgan Spice Gold, so it was a whole Caribbean theme. And, um, and we basically had like these Jamaican and Cuban flags on these yachts. And in the morning, everyone drove out of Soweto, and there was a traffic jam. The Metro police had to put a car there to chase people away. No one had ever seen a yacht. And then we ran this beach party where everyone just came and they lay on the beach and they ran the sand through, through their hands and they wore beach stuff. Um, we ran a surf report, you know, the uh, surfs up in Soweto dunes. And, um, and it was an incredible marketing success story because it was about capturing the imagination. You know, we talk about um, creating experiences that um, your competitors can't offer and, and your, your consumer can't buy. No one could buy that experience. It was a unique thing. We had beach buggies in the streets. In fact, we had a great thing because the week before we launched the first one, we were taking a Sunday Times journalist around the dam and the boat bumped into a dead body, as you would only find in Soweto. And the client was, oh, what are we going to do? This is terrible. It's going to be headlines in the Sunday Times. I said, no, it's fine. Shark attack in Soweto. <laughs> so, no one went for that. Um, but then we had other things. We, um, we uh, um, created a, a, a cooking show. And this cooking show is called the Perfect Sashebo Show. And it's an amazing thing because um, it's the biggest cooking show in Africa. It's been going for seven years. It's... Um, it's, uh, you know, you hear about MasterChef and stuff like that, uh, you know, talk about the perfect Sashebo show in the, in the suburbs around here. Everyone kind of looks at me blankly, and if I mention it in the townships, I'm like Jamie Oliver, you know, you created the perfect Sashebo show. Bongani over there ran it with me for many years. Um, and it was built around a Sashebo, is what a curry is to Indians, a Sashebo is to Africans. It's like a stew or a casserole or that kind of thing. And the perfect Sashebo is about a modern African woman who comes home from work. She's got, she wants to cook her cultural dish, Sashebo, but she does, has time and convenience issues. And we built this. And seven years later, it's the, still the biggest, um, most watched, the 10th most watched program on South African television each time it comes out. Um, we had another crazy thing where we were asked by Parmalat Cheese to launch a single a cheese slice into um, the townships. And they asked us if we'd get it into lunch boxes and schools. And we said we should put it into fet cooks or amaguinha or something called a porta, which is like a quarter loaf of bread with slut chips and poloni and hacha. And we said, let's get a cheese slice in there. And today, six, seven years later, um, they sell 1.2 billion rands worth of cheese slices a year. One cheese slice is eaten every 21 seconds. And 35% of Parmalat South Africa's gross profit now comes from cheese slices going into quarters. Wow. So we created these... Um, <clears throat> and and it's this, also this recognition of these opportunities because... Um, the, 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 what I call the Gassi course market, the township fast food industry, is worth about 87 billion rand a year today. Um, it employs 200 to 300,000 people. There's about, uh, there about 50,000 um, Gassi course outlets. And I do work with people like McDonald's who cannot compete with the Gorda outlet. People prefer the food that's township food because it reflects their styles, their tastes, and those kind of things. And um, we work with these outlets, um, with an entrepreneurship program with them. And, um, but, but there's this huge industry. And there were many other industries. You know, the Muti industry is worth 3 billion rand a year. Um, but because it's fragmented, it's this multitude of small little businesses. No one recognizes how big it is. Um, and, you know, in, in Africa, plants are seen to have protective and healing power. Because we see plants as flowers and nutrition. Um, and, and the Muti markets are, are herbal markets, They're the homeopaths, the inyangas, um, and there's these massive uh, markets. And not a single company, agricultural business, 
nursery is actually supplying this 3 billion rand market because it's not recognized as a market. So there's these huge marketplaces out there. And, and importantly, we should be helping those businesses grow. Instead of trying to formalize them, our big thing was about how to, to grow this informal sector, creating jobs, sustaining businesses. Um, the Minister of Small Business said the other day, we need to create more entrepreneurs in Soweto. And I was like, is she mad? There are hundreds of thousands, millions of entrepreneurs. She needs to recognize them as entrepreneurs, and we should be supporting them. And so Gasinomics was about the economics of the township, but also, very importantly, understanding the cultures that drive those, those businesses um, and how we should be supporting and, and elevating those entrepreneurs by recognizing them. Amazing story. Uh, first of all, thank you to Tracy for, uh, from I Love Books for supporting and pushing Gigi. You know, we all need a bit of a push sometimes to, to go the extra mile because on our own accord we, we sometimes battle uh, and we don't know that we have got gold of other people. And I, and I guess that's what the Business Book Club is about. It's about sharing this knowledge because before today, who knew about Gigi? Yeah. Exactly, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and knew about this market um, that exists, you know, and, and, and we're living in a, in, a, in a country that we want to embrace, and we want to call it our country, but we know Jack. <laughs> we don't know anything about it, because there's such a big market that, that, that is out there that hasn't been understood. And I, and I love the, the story that he's saying that if you want to understand a man's culture, speak his language. And that culture is really where we get to understand each other, and, and we don't have to have each other's culture, but if I want to understand you, and I have an understanding of your culture. Now, one of the, one of the things that you talk about in your book and that you do is you, you get the rich executives from their leather chairs and their high-rise offices, and you take them to where the action is. Why do you do that? So we, we call them immersions, and in fact, uh, as I said, I was in Soweto earlier, I've got a group of executives from Momentum who are busy sleeping in Soweto tonight. So either feel envious or feel um, sorry for them, uh, <laughs> up to you. But um, they've been traipsing around, around the township all day and riding taxis. And one of the things that we say is you need to understand the consumer from their perspective and not from your own. Um, and understand people from that perspective as well. And there's no better way than to experience it in people's homes, in people's environments, as they are. So we take executives and we run these immersions where people spend some time in those areas, whether it's a rural environment, in a shack, riding a taxi, walk, working with a hawker, um, selling stuff in a spaza, being a mooty seller for a day or whatever it might be. <laughs> And it's really about creating an understanding on one hand, and on the other hand, helping people identify opportunity. And I talk about the invisible matrix. Um, you know, in the movie The Matrix, these guys move from one world to another, you know, seamlessly. And the informal markets all around us, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not just about in the townships. We have hawkers on the street corner. We have Muti people just down the road here in Randburg. And, these worlds are around us, and it's about having a different lens. You know, the crazy thing is that we know more about wildlife in Africa, about the kind of animals, the habitats, the lifestyles, what they do, what they eat, than we know about the people in Africa. And that is, a, that is crazy. Um, and uh, so one of the things for us is about how do we expose people to that understanding. And a lot of it is not about you know, we make the mistake of seeing people in, in townships and stuff and believing that they, they are unhappy. You know, the reality is rich pe you know, happiness and wealth are not the same thing. Many rich people are, are incredibly unhappy and incredibly lonely, and many poor people are very happy and, and, and certainly not lonely. And we need to break down these kind of simple, linear understandings of people. Um, you know, and, and uh, part of that understanding of taking people into those environments. You know, you visit a shack, and a shack is someone's home. You know, we take away from it when we look at a shack. And many of the shacks, and I described some of them in the book, you know, one of the old man had, uh, you know, rose bushes, and he was, you know, and I had a client who was asking about how tough is it living in the township. He's like, come and see my roses. Oh, don't you like my roses? They're flowering. You know, these are real people, and... Um, 
And one of the things I did some research a while ago for one of my clients around personal care items, and um, I was asking people if they had, who were quite poor, if they had more money, what would they buy? And they said, we would buy um, clothes for ourselves and our children. And at first I thought they were so vain, you know, why don't you say you'll buy, spend money on education stuff? And the underlying thing was, because we're poor doesn't mean we want to look poor. And there's this human desire for dignity and for respect and mutual respect. And, and it's about exposing people to, to, to that. Um, and, you know, part of the same group, they wash diligently every morning and every night, despite the fact that they walk to a stand pipe on the corner and then they boil the water on a primer stove. And I said, oh, my family only wash once a day. They were like, oh, shame, have you got no water? <laughs> and I felt embarrassed by these people who felt sorry for me because I couldn't wash twice a day. So it's really about exposing people to that environment. I think another element about it is that we don't measure this. It's an unquantifiable environment. And um, I have a, a guy who sells quarters, and, and, and if I won't go to so, but many people who actually earn very good money in the township environment. And um, in fact, I'll tell you the story quickly. This is a guy who sells quarters who makes a lot of money, and he went to, uh, went to visit him, and he had a Jeep parked in his um, driveway. <laughs> and his quarter shop's about the size of the space you're all sitting in. He sells 2,400 quarters a day. His staff peel 80 bags of potatoes to make chips every single day. And uh, he had this Jeep, and I saw the Jeep, and I said, really nice car. And uh, he said, yeah, it is so difficult to get. So I said, well, um, yeah, they're very expensive. So he said, no, I had the money in cash. He had the money. He went to Jeep in the south, and he found the Jeep he wanted. He said, I'd like to buy this. They said, would you like to finance it? He said, no, I've got the cash. So he said, oh, you must talk to the finance lady. So he went to the finance lady, and uh, he said to her, um, and, and she gave him this form, and he had to fill it in, and he said, one of the lines said, source of income, and he wrote their quarters. And she refused to take his money. She sent him off because she believed it was some kind of drug. Wow. And, and uh, the problem is that we ignore these opportunities because we cannot believe that people are, are making this kind of money. And I was interviewed by Zania Masaka in 702 about the quarter industry. And she got a guy on radio, you can get the podcast, and she chatted to him about it after chatting to me and said, how much money do you make a month? He said, I make 50,000 rand a day. She wow. said, no, 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 how much, a month 50,000? He said, no, 50,000 a day. And we cannot conceptualize that there's these businesses in these environments. Um, because they're unquantified. And we look at our unemployment figures in this country and we say, well, we've got 27 to 30 percent of our population is unemployed. Those are people who have a pay slip. We don't measure the people, whether it's a hawker who's earning 5,000 rand a month or the quarter guy who's earning 50,000 rand a day. We don't measure them. We measure them as unemployed. And we don't understand that informal sector, so we don't try and appreciate it. My belief is that if you took income generating activities of all forms in the informal sector, our unemployment is probably closer to 10%. Wow. But then we have to start accommodating the informal sector. And how do we support those business people? How do we give them loans? How do we recognize? How do we let them buy a car um, if he wants to buy a car for his business and so on and so forth? Mm. All right, we'd like to open the floor and get some questions from the audience. Gigi, are you ready for that? Uh, they can ask you anything. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> okay, Gigi has committed to uh, answering any question. Please go ahead. Yes. Hi, Gigi. Thanks for the, <coughs> thanks for the talk. The talk My name is Jeff. Uh, I need to understand what, what, when the walls are thundering, what is that? Mean? All right. So the, so the question from Jeff there <laughs> is he asking if the walls are thundering, what does that mean? Um, what does it mean in terms of, of what are they describing? Yes. So, um, if you, when you arrive, I mean, you come from a rural area, you have the bellowing of cows and the crowing of, of roosts, and you arrive in downtown Joburg, especially where, where um, JP Hostel and uh, George Goff Hostels are in downtown Joburg, and the, the streets echo, you know, there's this thundering and the, this, um, yeah. 
yeah. this noise all around you and it never stops, you know, the walls are perpetually echoing with sound of cars and people and all of those kind of things. And for people from rural areas, that's, it's quite shocking and scary. People to describe when they first came to the city of how they can't sleep. They're afraid, they keep waking up with all of this noise around them. And then there's also all this light. You must know you come from a rural area. Um, in fact, we had a granny whose house was being electrified and had just been electrified and I was doing some work with Eskim and we were interviewing how electricity changed people's lives. And this Gorko had come from a rural area. She said, hey, Danami, I love this thing, electricity, because when I wake up and it's still dark, I can switch on the lights, I can find the matches, light the candle, turn on the FM and then switch off the lights. <laughs> so so um, <laughs> you can imagine it's a different world and it's a big, loud, noisy, noisy space. Wow. So, so one of the interesting things about the Zulu language specifically is it, it's a descriptive language, so it describes stuff. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. You know, it's not like English where we, you know, we use single words to describe single things. Where in Zulu you've got one word, but it, it's a description of of a of a scene or a scenario. Could you maybe give us one or two examples of that? I, I think I mean in in. Um it's a very descriptive language, but it's also a self-depreciating language. Often, like you know, the British sense of humour and the kind of Zulu sense of humour is very similar in terms of the fact that it's self-depreciative and, and uh, has a great sense of humour. Um, I was sent a, a WhatsApp about um, about uh, Zuma a while ago, and it was a thing that said. Um, which means that it's so hot and dry that you would swear that um, Zuma has stolen the money of the rain. Um, another one was this fat child, um, really, really fat baby. And it said, which means it was this fat child, and it said, You'll, you'll know a child when he's still young that he'll own taxis. Oh, wow. <laughs> gives him out, yeah. um, so there's many words. Um, the one um, Johnny Clegg talks a lot about, and, and I was always accused of it as a child, is, is the term of inkani, which I've been told is an obstinate stubbornness. Yeah. But it goes more than that. A, a, a young Zulu man is expected to have inkani. Not it's not, uh, you know, it's like you will be stubborn and you will be obstinate. And there's a saying, I leave it bigger journey, which means plow straight for the rock. If there's a rock in the field and you're plowing, you don't go around the rock, you, you, you knock the, the rock out. And that is what is expected of a Zulu man. So there's these terms and these philosophies. And there's a very serious depth and philosophy and poetry um, in these societies. And, and not only Zulu, Sutu Koza, um, Baby, that's the one I'm most comfortable with, but uh, it, throughout all of these. It's very interesting, you find that if you can speak Zulu, you understand the idioms and you understand the references and the other languages, because the underlying philosophy and culture is, is almost identical. Yes, Steve. Okay, you guys can fight tomorrow. <laughs> we will take both. So, so Keke, okay, you go. Go for it. So, he is a baby and he's speaking to me in Zulu, so <laughs> luckily for me, because my baby is not that very good, although it is oh, conversational. Wow. But, um, and the question is, and a very pertinent question is about what difference, you know, the large proportion of white people don't speak an African language, and what difference would that make, particularly to our economy? Um, and I think it's a tragedy because, um, you know, you find with my daughters, with Donsia and Zandi, the number of people who will say to me, what does their name mean? Um, why did you give them a Zulu name? But if they had a, Latin, uh, a French name, or you know, if, if they had an Italian name, or, or whatever, no one asks you the same question. 
yeah. and people go and learn French and all of these kind of elements in our society. Um, and it's a tragedy because with a very small amount of Zulu or Sutu or Bedi or Kosa, whatever it might be, it can transform your interaction with other people on a first level. It can give you huge opportunities. Um, I've done incredibly well out of, out of benefits of that. Um, but it, I think it should be compulsory in schools to have one of these languages. My daughter, um, Zandi, uh, had to choose between Zulu. In fact, both of them had to choose between Zulu and uh, Afrikaans. And um, I have no problem with Afrikaans, but I was fascinated by how many parents, including black parents, black South African parents, actually chose Afrikaans over Zulu. And, and I find that hard to understand, to be honest. And on the one hand, as a parent, it's easier to teach your kids because you can speak Afrikaans. But um, it would transform this country if more people um, could get around language. Because even I have a friend who's just started learning Zulu, and he's in business, and he talks to everyone in Zulu. His Zulu is shocking. Half the time you can't understand it. But people love him. They love him for it. They forgive him for everything. He gets away with traffic fines. And he was driving drunk down the road the other day, and uh, the cop greeted him in Zulu, and he spoke back, and then they chatted, and the cop said, you are very drunk, but you speak Zulu badly as well. I should give you two fines. And uh, one for Zulu and one for drunk and driving. Go. Go straight home. So, you know, I mean, on, on a fun level, but it, I think it could have a transformative effect on our country, um, particularly spoken Zulu. I think the mistakes the schools make, they're often teaching a deep Zulu with poetry and all of that kind of stuff. Just teach the way it's spoken, or teach the way Sutu is spoken. Lovely, I love that. Yes, Steve. So, uh, so going on. Zulu, <laughs> <laughs> So I think that I would disagree with you and say the government wants to control things and people in the informal sector don't like control. Um, and I look at the same in business, you know, a lot of people ask me about the taxation issues. And if you look at, I was in went downtown Joburg at uh, 6 o'clock this morning and there are hundreds and thousands of hawkers on the streets and they're all selling fed cooks and um, vegetables and fruit and biscuits and clothes and whatever it might be. Um, and they're all on the street there. And Coca-Cola has a rule that if you have a Coca-Cola, it has to be within an arm's reach of any person. And Coca-Cola has this as their plan throughout the world. How do you get a Coca-Cola in arm's reach? In fact, the idea is if you could have an advert with the Coke came through the TV and thrust the Coke into your lap, that's how close it should be. The informal sector is exactly the same. The, the, the hawker um, has to be selling within an arm's reach. No one's going to walk to a marketplace. 
course, the government wants to put them in a marketplace away from where the traffic is. What the government should be doing is building larger pavements and having within the pavements plug points where the people who are cooking could do that instead of bringing a catered gas cylinder. They should be providing them with storage. When we look at the housing environment, um, you know, what is the enabling component? People in that sector abide by rules and conventions that make sense, that add value or enable them to improve their lives. If you look at the building industry, there's a massive, massive, um, uh, you know, as you would probably know, renovations and building industry in the townships. It's driven primarily by people. Um, so, so how it works, and, and I've done some work with PPC and some of the building um, people like, like that in terms of some research, is that when you want to um, renovate your house, you get a builder, he comes there, he looks at your house, he gives you an idea of how much it will cost him in labor, and then he gives you a list of things that you have to go and purchase. So then you go off and you purchase them. And you'll find every house has you know, a pile of bricks under the house, some cement under a plastic thing, some, some building, you know, um, some, some concrete mix over there in this house. And over six months to a year to two years, I was at a house and this guy had this huge slab and I said to him, um, did they make this, and he had a little house on the edge of it, and I said, um, did they make a mistake and make the slab too big? He said, no, so that's my dining room, that's the lounge, that's going to be the children's bedroom, and every single month he buys a couple of bricks and a little bag of cement or whatever, and when he's ready, he then phones up that builder and he says, come and help me um, renovate, my, uh, build my house, and the builder arrives and, and off they go. Now, that, and, and, and if he doesn't buy it like that, he does lay-buys. Now, people say in this market, people don't plan. Absolute rubbish. You know, lay buys is the craziest thing. I'm into motorbikes. I can't imagine paying for six months to a year and only getting my motorbike at the end of the year. I want it now, you know, I want it in two hours. My wife, if we renovate the house, she wants that renovation done and dusted. So I go to the bank and get on my knees and I get that um, extension on my home loan. Someone in the township market can't do that. He can't get the extension on his home loan. He can't get a home loan because 90% of the time there's no title deeds on that property and the government has this crazy idea about not giving title deeds. So what do you do? You end up doing it informally. You do it by lay-by. You go to a Mashonisa loan shark and borrow the money there. You build it slowly, slowly. Um, and so, yes, yeah, sometimes it's a little bit skew and wonky because this builder built half while you could afford it. And then next time he'd gone back to Mozambique and then you've got a guy from the Boa Formo and he came and he finished it. So, so the issue is, is that um, you have to look at how things enable. Will people pay tax in this environment? Absolutely, if there was a value add. The taxi industry is an example. You ever say, well, how do you control them? How do you do that? What are you giving them? Are you giving them, you know, you're building cycle lanes in Santon, but you're not putting taxi lanes. Yeah. You know, and why shouldn't the taxis have a lane like the Ria Via bus has? They're providing a more important, they carry far more people. Um, so, so, you know, if you said to the taxis, we'll give you a taxi lane, we'll enable you to use a taxi lane, but you're going to have to go cashless on your staff, your, your passengers and pay your completely different exercise. If you said to the hawker, you can have that space over there, but you're going to have to pay X amount or, or, or tax, or whatever, it's a completely different exercise because suddenly I need it. We push these people to the peripheries of our society, and at the same time we push them to the peripheries of laws, bylaws, we push them out without giving them any value add. We don't have an attraction mechanism which says, come into the formal economy, or come into the tax net, or um, how do we create bylaws in the government that allows you to, to do um, you know, the things that we do. Um, you know, people in the township don't want to move off that four-room house. They, they don't want to, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a typical suburb, you can do postal code marketing. You can say to someone, you know, you live in Bryanston, that's your postal code, that's your income level, and so on and so forth. In the townships, you have the mansion next to the forum house, next to the shack, next to a bigger house, because people would rather renovate and build that house and stay in that community. They want to sell and move to another space. But that comes with it, the fact that you've got this tiny little piece of land and you're wanting to go up and, and right to the edge of the property. You don't want to have a piece of 
you know, what's it, one meter between your neighbor's wall and your building. You go right to the end and you go three stories up. Um, so these are the constraints, but the government said, no, 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 you can't do that here, you can't actually grow it bigger, why don't you sell that house and go to Protea where there's bigger stands? No, you don't want to go to Protea, you want to stay in this community, so how do we enable those kind of elements? And, and my big argument with a lot of government stuff is that you've got to create value adds, you've got to create the carrot more than you're creating the stick. And you've most importantly got to understand that people aren't doing that because they're wanting to break the law. They're doing that because it's the most practical, it's the most cost-effective, or it's the most culturally comfortable way of doing things. And when they do it that way, that makes sense to them. So then how do we adapt to that? Um, and, and uh, you know, if, if I go look at New York, you know, people want to live in apartments. If you're a South African, you think, geez, there's no lawn, there's none of this kind of thing. But people prefer that in certain environments. The same in the township. People don't want to live in high-rises, but they want to live in close proximity within a certain street. How are we creating these laws that allow them to do that? And I'm not saying don't have plans, don't have safety, don't have all of those things. Have those things within the context of what people want to do and what's practical for them. Oh, I'm going to take two more questions uh, before we wrap up this beautiful evening. So, first over here, and then our lovely photographer as well. I just wanted to know, um, you know, I've got a client of mine that also started as a shepherd, and they ended up getting a very successful job, but his, his family structure, that's really important about this is he's made 17 people in his family, established them that they actually on their feet financially. And I'm just wondering, in the kind of context of, of that you're describing, what role does family, family support, family businesses play in, in, in spreading that, in spreading that community? All right, so, the, so just, I just want to repeat the question so that everybody can get it. And that is, you have a friend that is, was a shepherd and then isn't one anymore, and he's, he's assisted 17 businesses to grow and prosper, but it was done in a family context and in a family environment. And the question then is, is how do we, how does that work? How do we leverage from that? How do we understand it? Am I correct? So, the answer is, the the family and the social group is incredibly important. I often talk about the modern village, that if you replicate these societies, they're about the village. And it's not about Soweto, let's use Soweto as an example. It's about Naledi, or it's about Zola, or it's about my family, or the street, is that these are very tight social communities, and you have to look after them. So if you look at the migrant workers who move to the hostels, you have generations of people from one Skordi, one little tribal area, who will all go to the same room in that hostel, or the same person in that hostel, and if you're unemployed, you arrive there, the person from your village will look after you. And it's a wonderful thing, unless you're like me, and have the entire <coughs> district expecting you, the person who's going to help them out. So, yeah. I have a perpetual thing of, oh, I'm for it, and don't know about you know, can we get a job, or hey, just anything you can help find it for us, is that you're expected. It is the expectation is that you will contribute to that. And I, you know, talk about the fact that if you look at, at uh, called Western society, we grow up dependent on our parents, and um, we become independent. And then we spend the rest of our lives going to life coaches and people teaching us to do teamwork and to be interdependent. In an African society, we go from the kids being dependent on their parents, and then they, we go to inter, interdependence. And we spend the rest of our lives saying to people, be an individual, st stand out from the crowd, and we try and teach them to be independent. Because culturally and socially, interdependence is far more powerful. We did work for Coca-Cola in schoolyards in in both from Bishop's Court to, to Soweto to Kailisha and stuff like that. All the kids in the township schools at lunchtime sit down together, put their lunch boxes into the center, and everyone shares from the lunch boxes there. Everyone shares it. In the white schools, they all sit down in a circle and they all have their lunch box on their lap and they each eat from their own lunch box. Dramatically different. The kids said, we prefer ads where we see people sharing. 
because that is what is important to us. When the kids go home, they go home as a group. And they walk a gang, and they'll call it the gang going home. home. So this sense of looking after each other, of social inter interdependence, comes out in things. It comes out in stock fells. It comes out in church groups. It comes out on the portrait. It is something almost hardwired into these societies. And not only in South Africa. We see it in Kenya. We see it in Lagos. Um, is, is the sense of, of social community, this modern village, which is still the village and all the things that are reliant on within this um, village. So, um, so the sense of, of the family importance, but the person who is successful is expected to give back to the group because the, you're only there because of your community. It doesn't matter that they helped you there or not. You are there because you're a child of this village and you are, because of us, you were successful. Even if they did not lift a hand, you are successful. So the expectation is that you will assist this um, community. And generally, people um, are respected better and, and more for it. The contrast to that is you find it very difficult in the corporate and business environment to get people to stand out from the group, to lead as an individual, as opposed to trying to get some sort of, of um, group consensus. I don't know if that kind of, but it's a hardwired philosophy, and I think that going back to culture, you know, culture is a critical thing. If you have an Afrikaner who's a stockbroker in New York, they don't suddenly stop being an Afrikaner. Culturally, all sorts of things about family, food, and you know, these things are part of your culture, and and, and you can't escape them. Beautiful stories. All right, last question, Tisha. How easy? How easy did the you're white, so you kind of obviously at first you're true. And how acceptable were they actually from you being white? The question is, is how did the how did the Zulus accept your white family into into their, their tribe and into their community? So it took a while, um, and I write a lot about it in Third World Child. Um, but um, it was in the little things in a way. First of all, here we were living in the Zulu um, style in a mud hut, no running water, no electricity. Um, the, the language, obviously. When people used to come and visit um, my parents to, to find out more about what they were doing there, my mother would make them tea and biscuits, whatever, and kneel in front of the men and, and serve the men first. And she still finds it difficult to to have someone serving the women first. Um, so, so it was in these things, and they couldn't believe it. Yeah, you must know, in an apartheid society, they're surrounded in a place called Vienna by the most agro uh, kind of Afrikaner farmers in, in the country. I mean, it was, they were crazy people. And, um, and uh, there was this white woman kneeling in front of them. Um, I went with the Shembe's um, with my wife and family, and the Shembe are a Zulu-based kind of church in KZM, one of the larger independent churches in this country. And we climbed um, this sacred mountain. And we all, you're not allowed to wear shoes, so we're all barefoot. I must tell you, I used to be barefoot as a kid. It doesn't work very well anymore. Um, and my wife had to put a, a duck over her head and cover her shoulders. And when we walked up the mountain, they didn't know that we spoke Zulu. And people would comment as we walked, oh, they respect us, look. The, the woman is wearing a duck and look, they're barefoot. And oh, shame, that one is, you know, not walking very well barefoot, you know. So, I mean, of course, all this chatter around us. It's those little things about teaching, uh, uh, appreciation, empathy, um, and respect. You know, you, you know, my mother's a very strong, independent person. Um, but when she was within this um, community, this rural, tribal community, she understood that this is what it was about. It wasn't taking away from, from her feminine uh, beliefs, and she was a very strong feminist, um, but it was about respecting those cultural things. And as we did those, and, and uh, my father had his famous fights with local police and stuff where people had been tortured or, or taken advantage of. And as those built, it's a society where word of mouth is hugely powerful, and overnight suddenly we started, you know, we were part of that community. Um, and today, my mother, as I said, lives in that mud hut, and, 
and she's Ukoko, you know, she lives there and someone dies, she goes and sits in a lindela with a blanket over her and uh, she, she's part of that. Um, if someone dies, my brother who still lives there, you know, is digging the, the grave with the men as, 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 as it should be. Um, and those are the things that allow you and make you accepted within a society is that you're not the observer. You're a participant, and when it was hot, we were hot. When it was dry, we were dry. When the black biting ants ate our bare feet, our feet looked just the same as the black kids with us. And, and that meant, you know, and at first they were suspicious. They must have money. White people, all white people have money. You know? People yeah. say it's still Abilung Bane Mali. You know? So, um, you know, so, uh, and we weren't. We were genuinely very, very poor, and, and we were part of the, that. And, and um, as, as we were part of their struggles, we were also part of that community and, and uh, belonged. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for tonight. Um, but the, the two books are on sale. So, Kirsten, how it works is we take a book and we go downstairs and we can pay for it down there. So, so please support yeah, bring it, bring it up to, to the GG to get your book signed. Uh, let's support our local authors. That is, this is really what this is about. Uh, giving, giving them an opportunity to showcase their story and for us to learn. Uh, so Gigi, thank you so much for sharing your story with us tonight. I mean, really, it's, it's been fascinating. Thank you for your time um, and sharing all of that. Let me just uh, give another uh, uh, round of applause to Gigi. All right, and then we just, I just want to thank Scoops. Scoops, you guys are always hosting us here. Thank you so, so much. Um, you know, yeah, you're just offering all of this business, so thank you, thank you so much. I mean, Scoops is, it's a, it's a beautiful place. They've got lovely books and stuff downstairs, lovely stuff for children. Uh, it's a place of knowledge. Um, so, so thank you so much. And thank you to, to Letitia for taking the photographs. Each photograph, ladies and gentlemen, that you have with the book goes to the Signature Library. I'm going to share a bit about that with you. But those. Those photos go to the signature library so that when the kids take out the box, they can see who donated it. So it makes a bit of an emotional connection with, and, and, and hence why the signature library. And I always um, ask people to, to write something in the book. Why, why are you donating this book? Because that's what the signature library is about. You know, what's the message that you want somebody else who's reading your, the book that you're giving? What is it that you think they should they should get. What's that message? What's that message that you and imagine? Imagine if we all wrote a message in a book of why we think. And I mean, books are there to share and to love and to care and to and to distribute um, because it raises our level of consciousness. And I'd just like to thank our pianist. Thank you so much for 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 giving us music to our ears. Um, thank you very much for that. And and to my my right hand person, Jane. Thank you for all your care and thank you for always looking after the business book club. Um, and for taking taking all the Facebook posts and all of that, and and with that, there's something else I'd like to share with you guys tonight. You know, I started the business book club um, as a as a fun idea of, of sharing a bit of knowledge. Um, you know, then then we got the idea of the signature library, and and that's really been working well. And you know, it's really you know making a difference and in, in, in sharing these books. And you know, through five events, it means we. We're basically collecting about 50 books an event, plus minus. Um, and, and these books get circulated in a system. For, for me, it wasn't just to give the books away. We can all give stuff away. But it's about putting it into a system where people have got access to it all the time. So that you can, you can, you can have a book, you can get access to the, to the knowledge, but you put it back to the system so that somebody else can have, have that knowledge. Because, you know, as Gigi has rightly pointed out, sharing is caring. And, and that's what that is about. So, so there's, there's two things that, that I want to do different with the Business Book Club. And the one is, I think we've, we've, we've reached the stage where it's, it's, we, we are ready to go to the next level. And, and the next level is quite huge. Um, we, want to take, we want to take the Business Book Club global. Um, what does that mean? And, and why do we want to do that? Well, I think, I think the world needs access to more knowledge. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of clutter out there, but the Business Book Club, we, we, we get down to the authors, and, and the authors that we've had here are very specific. They, they're business-orientated, they're business-related, 
and business is fortunately or unfortunately 80% of our lives. You know, we spend 80% we spend of our time in a, in, a, in a business environment. And if we're not conscious in that environment of what we're doing and how, we, how we're making money and how we're making ends meet and, and how we're finding purpose and all of that, I think we, we're missing out on a big portion of life. You know, to put it bluntly. So we want to take this global, but we need help. Um, so, but how do you eat an elephant? So the vision is really to take this global, but how do we eat an elephant? Well, you eat it bit by bit. So the, the, the goal that we've set ourselves is to open up another three business book clubs in the next year. Um, we love the idea of, of supporting independent book clubs, ind independent bookstores, to host them. Um, so, so that's really what we want to do. And if you're interested in, in becoming involved in the Business Book Club, you're interested in interviewing authors um, and sharing some of that knowledge, please contact me. If you've got any ideas of doing stuff differently in the Business Book Club, you know, you, know, you, only, you only can see the world through your own eyes. Um, but when you get the eyes of other people and you get that shared, you've got so many other views to look at. You know, so when we run the Business Book Club, we only run it from our point of view. But if you, if you care to share with us, I'm happy to take those suggestions and, and to see how we can incorporate it into the business book club to really make it, this is an event for you guys. I mean, if I wanted to know what these books were about, I just would have read them and found Gigi. <laughs> or to go for a beer and a shabin and, uh, <laughs> you know, had the conversation. But it's, but it's much more than that. So, so that's the one thing. And then the other thing, to, to take it global, we want to do it through a podcast system. We want to take these conversations and, and put it on a podcast and share it. You know, share, share the stories, share the knowledge, so that we can raise the level of consciousness of people and, and hopefully they can change behaviors and we can, we can do something great. You know, like Steve Jobs always said, you know, make a little dent in the universe. If we can do that through, through, through the raising of knowledge and the raising of consciousness, you know, it's something worthwhile to be part of. So if anybody's got... Um, a, a calling to be part of that or, or to, to add some value to this. I'm very open to suggestions. I'm very open to, to some, some of you. Yes? Hi. I'm sorry to derail you a little bit. My name is Bongani. Hi, Bongani. Yes, I, I'm an aspiring writer. I found that the most difficult thing, uh, a snag that I hit, was that when I reached a certain part of my book, I needed someone to read my book and take me to the next level. And I found that it was so difficult to find qualified people that could read my book without charging me 12 grand. Because everyone I met wanted 6 to 12 grand just to proofread my book. And I even tried online and stuff like that. Is there a part of your book club that could help a guy like me who is an aspiring writer? I've written like maybe 20 scripts. And I always write them and leave them halfway because I reach a point where I feel, okay, Maybe I've overwritten here. Have I told the message clearly? And have I told the story clearly? Have I, have I hit the nail on the head? Have I hit the why? I started writing. So I feel that that's, what, that's the help that if you could do that in a community, that would take you to the next level. Well, we haven't considered that, but I mean, we, we, we're happy to have those conversations. Um, and you know, speak to speak to scoops, and we'll we'll see how we how we can take that further. So so let's have a conversation afterwards, guys. Please stay. Uh, this is also about networking and and having a conversation. Get your book signed uh, by Gigi. He will be here for a while. You happy to do that? And then thank you to everybody. Thank you for your book donations. Thank you for for supporting the Signature Library in, in that sense. Um, and yeah, please please have a have a have a beautiful evening. Thank you very much for your support.